This is Radio Japan, NHK World Network Tokyo. Ici Radio Japon, NHK World, émission internationale de la NHK. So a lot of folks uh, happened to enjoy that last video about the receivers of the uh, late 50s through the uh, 60s. And uh, everybody had their favorite receiver. Some of uh, them were missed, of course, because I couldn't possibly discover all of them or figure all of them out. And uh, we left some, some out, no doubt. But uh, some were direct hits. I mean, the story as it was told was exactly what they experienced, and that was uh, very exciting. So uh, there were some questions about the Holocrafters. There were some questions about the Lafayettes. You know, uh, why did you only go over a few of the, La of the Lafayettes? The HE this, the HE that. Well, that's because they were importing at such a rate that virtually every year there were different receiver runs in their catalogs. So I, I couldn't possibly show all of the variations that Hallicrafters and, and Lafayette came up with. Uh, there's variations of variations. And uh, this particular one that I showed at the beginning of the video is an HE. Uh, so HA-700, the HA-700, and uh, uh, this Lafayette receiver is an import, its valve, its tubes, but the HA-600 um, is solid state. So they didn't even do stuff in order, it's just, it's just a, a model number. So I decided to try to get this guy working. When I opened it up, it was in really bad shape on top and there had been some kind of a fire or something over here in the power supply section as well so I guess we should bring this back it's going to take a couple of videos to bring this receiver back if you like receiver restoration type videos this is not really uh, high class uh, you know bringing something back to pristine condition I'm talking about bringing it back to safe condition calibrating it and getting it back on the bench so um, We'll see if we can bring this guy back to life. That's what this video is all about. Yes, I admit it, it's pretty dirty looking. And uh, it's going to need some cleanup on the front panel, and those knobs are certainly going to need some work. Uh, over time, you know, the dust will collect. And this radio doesn't look unlike what we might find at a ham flea market or neighborhood flea market or maybe even on eBay um, if we uh, look at some of this uh, you're gonna see the dust you know it builds up now fortunately on the bottom you do not have as much dust build up but it looks like we might have had a little volcano over here in the corner what's uh, causing this um, looks like the transformer might have boiled over so that's gonna be something we'll be investigating so let's look at the general layout and I think they've done a beautiful job on this layout it's actually a lesson in 1950s receiver best practices notice how the most sensitive stages in the front end are located completely kitty corner to the power components this is really smart layout keep your power supply away from your RF front end also uh, notice in general um, this is where all the heat's going to be generated, and your, uh, your converter tube right here is pretty far away, so that's going to help with your, uh, your tuning stability and your drift. Also, notice that the signal direction, generally there might be an antenna connector here, you work up this way, you come down through the front end, you keep going through the IF, you take a left-hand turn and go through the IF stages into the audio stages, the transformer, and out. It's a very nice layout. This L-shaped layout is exactly right uh, for receiver design. Uh, the tuning capacitors are on the top panel where they're not going to be uh, influenced too much uh, by what's going on underneath the chassis. Here's the band uh, plan for the receiver. Now this is a pretty nice receiver. It has five bands covering from 150 kilohertz all the way up to 30 megahertz in the shortwave bands. Uh, you notice there is a little bit of a gap 
between 0.4 and 0.55, and that leads us to believe we probably have a 450, a 455, or a 460 kilohertz IF. And of course, this is a standard 455 uh, IF. Also, uh, the RFIF gain control is uh, very nice. I like what they're doing here with the automatic gain control. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. So the functional block diagram, sure enough, it is a single conversion superheterodyne. It's got an RF stage with two tuned circuits, a mixer with a separate oscillator, um, two IF stages with filtering, a product detector with a BFO, and separate AM automatic noise limiting and automatic volume control. And then we have an audio amplifier and out to the phones. So pretty standard single conversion super heterodyne. Okay, the schematic diagram reveals that we have uh, indeed a double tuned circuit up front. Uh, this is important for uh, image rejection, as we'll see in a, a few minutes. Um, but I will uh, concentrate on uh, the power supply first. Let's look at the power supply. Now this is interesting. It looks like the line voltage is attached directly to the transformer. Where's the on-off switch? I don't see any on-off switch. Uh, this is a, a very clever system that uh, keeps power on the local oscillator mixer tube all the time. So as long as it's plugged into the wall, the receiver, even when it is off, OFF, -F, it will keep that tube lit up. Now what about high voltage? You don't want high voltage on when the set is off. It takes care of that with the uh, also part of the on-off mode switch, uh, S1B. When you're off, it disconnects the center tap of the transformer, so we do not get the high voltage out. However, be very careful with a circuit like this, and uh, do not oversize this fuse, or you will have something happen like happened to this receiver, which has a nice fat 5 amp fuse in it. It should be a, a 3 quarter amp or perhaps a 1 amp fast blow fuse for a, a system like this. So uh, once you do actually ground the center tap and close S1A, all the tubes will light, the high voltage will come up, and the set will be uh, operational. Remember, this is high voltage, and uh, these are uh, leaf lethal voltage, uh, certainly are going to give you a terrible electrical shock. We have both high voltage AC and DC in this receiver. So as always, be careful. Uh, looking a little bit closer at the schematic, we have an excellent tube that's 6BA6 uh, pentode that has uh, both manual and uh, automatic uh, volume control applied to it. We have a dual tube mixer, 6BL8, an excellent tube, uh, VHF uh, TV tuner tube, so it works fine at shortwave, that's for sure. And then we have a couple of IF stages, also 6BA6s. These uh, tubes are well known for uh, automatic uh, volume control uh, RF stages, lots of gain, lots of control range. Uh, this is an excellent setup. Uh, notice that these two filters are called MF1 and MF2. Uh, what do you mean MF1 and MF2? Well, we'll go over that a little bit later. Then we have a true product detector. Product detector shows that this receiver is a, a late design. It's not 40s and 50s design. It's probably more like late 50s, early 60s design, where single sideband was becoming more and more important. And uh, finally, the audio amplifier stage. Several diodes that are associated with the AM detector, as well as the uh, automatic volume control circuit, and an automatic noise limiter diode. Uh, the S meter is simply measuring the cathode current of the second IF stage, which is a clever way to, uh, to get an S meter. So a uh, pretty nice setup. Lots of uh, controls. Um, we can talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, image issue. The 
The HA700 receiver uses high side injection. That is, the local oscillator is tuned 455 kilohertz higher than the frequency you're actually tuned to. Let's look at an example. Uh, let's say we want to receive uh, CB channel 14 on band number 5. That's 27.125 megahertz. And we know the local oscillator is tuned 455 kilohertz higher than this or at 27.580 megahertz. The image frequency is located twice the IF or 910 kilohertz higher than the frequency that we're tuning. So for tuning that 27.125 we add the 910 kilohertz and we end up with our image occurring at 28.035 megahertz in the 10 meter ham band. Now if we only have 15 or 20 dB of image rejection, your ham buddy, your ham neighbor, sending code on 28.035 is going to come right straight in. Let's look at it another way and uh, I'll use uh, the front of the receiver as an example. Let's say we're tuning in some single sideband on 28.300 and we've, we've set our, uh, our logging scale properly so that we can we have a calibrated 28300. We're looking at single sideband here. And an AM station fires up at 29210 up here. He's going to come right in because he is 910 kilohertz higher than we are. And that means that uh, that AM station, if he's skipping in, he's very strong, he's going to come in and interfere with our single sideband we're trying to receive. Generally, this highest band in a single conversion receiver is the worst uh, situation you can have because the cue of the tuned circuits get uh, poor as you get to higher frequencies. And just in general, the, the, the resonance formula in physics limits your, uh, your cue and your selectivity as you go higher in frequency. So the only way to improve image rejection is to use a higher IF frequency because twice the IF would be further away from us, right? Might be somewhere way out of the band over here. Uh, or to use uh, uh, dual conversion where we have a first a high IF and then we convert to a low IF. So we could have a dual IFs like a low IFs for the low, low bands and high IF for the high bands or we could use dual conversion. Uh, the other thing we could do is just keep adding selectivity up front. If we keep adding more and more selectivity up front instead of maybe just having antenna and RF we have an additional uh, RF stage and have a triple tune circuit up front. That's another way to improve your image rejection performance. So some popular ways to improve your image rejection, especially with these older receivers. Uh, you know, back in the day, uh, RF preselectors were very, very popular. Uh, these included uh, dual gate MOSFETs, different types of high gain tubes like the 6BZ6, um, two FETs in a, a cascode configuration with uh, a uh, tune circuit on the input, a tune circuit on the output would add two more tune circuits to the front end of any, any receiver and probably give you uh, 30 or 40 dB of image rejection. Uh, the regenerative preselector is another one. Uh, this only requires usually one tune circuit because of its Q multiplication uh, effect as well as amplification. Adding a Q multiplier to the RF tune circuits rather than the IF tune circuits is another uh, interesting method not found very often in RF circuits but it does work of course this is much more difficult because uh, it's sharply tuning you've got to be able to band switch it uh, this is this is a little bit tricky uh, the method that I was most satisfied with is the crystal controlled converter the crystal control converter uses a tunable part of your receiver where you have good image rejection like uh, perhaps 40 meters and uh, you down convert from 15 meters or 10 meters or 11 meters down to 40 meters using a crystal 
and uh, this was a very common method. Now a, a good sharp antenna tuner, especially the kind that are resonant, can also give you quite a bit of uh, image rejection improvement. Having a tuned antenna might get you a few dB, but again, only 900 kilohertz away, you're not going to get much improvement with a tuned antenna. So uh, receivers like the old S120, for instance, would have real trouble on band 4, uh, where it does not have great image rejection. So let's talk about the MF here. Uh, these MFs uh, really stand for mechanical filter. Mechanical filter. When I hear the word mechanical filter, I immediately think of Collins. Uh, you know, mechanical is a misleading term. It invokes Collins, the patented Collins system. These are very expensive filters. Well, I will assure you these are not Collins mechanical filters. Uh, these filters are narrow ceramic resonators with tune transformer shaping and terminations on each end. They're nice little assemblies. They are very effective. They are sharp. They're maybe a bit too sharp for people that like uh, good quality AM. So what is inside those two little IF cans? One is a little bigger than the other one. And I surmise that maybe that's the can that contains the, uh, the two ceramic resonators. I think this might be a single ladder type filter. Maybe there's only one in there, but I think to get a proper filter shape you need to have two like this. Now the impedance that this presents is around 1K, 2K, that region. So you're going to need to tap the coils on both sides in order to get a good match in. So I believe that these coils are probably center tapped in some way. Also, um, we have to be able to put current through the coil to the mixer's plate. So you've got to have a coil anyway to, uh, in order to pass current. And uh, you need isolation. The resonator itself has enough isolation. It doesn't need a uh, coupling cap. So these are probably tuned and they're tapped to match the input of the ceramic filter. And similarly on the output, it would be tapped in order to uh, properly terminate the output. Now on the output side, we have uh, negative grid bias, automatic volume control, going to the IF of the uh, 6BA6 IF amplifiers. So now if there is no ceramic inside, uh, you could just lightly couple across here and uh, that would make a double tuned IF filter which would give you pretty good selectivity as well. But I don't think they did it that way. I think they did put in some uh, Toyo ceramic uh, resonators and built up a little single ladder ceramic mechanical filter. So these filters are very sharp. Maybe a bit too sharp for double side band AM detection. Guys that want high fidelity are not going to be really happy with these filters, but they're great for digging out weak signals. This does also hit on the winning Japanese idea of using multiple low-cost parts to approach the performance of one very high-cost part, like the Collins Mechanical Filter. So pretty much the last thing you want to do with these radios uh, when, you, when you acquire one is simply plug it in and turn it on. You do not want to do that, especially with some of these Japanese built radios from the early 60s. Um, the, uh, the wiring, of course, is all hand wiring, and you can see this is all hand wired from the 60s. And uh, over here, there's been an event of some kind. This is the power supply section. You can see there's some charring and a little bit of uh, cooking that's gone on. We don't know if this is a replacement transformer, if this is even working. Looks like somebody's doubled up the diodes. It's a pretty big mess over here. And there's some horrible twisted wires here and brittle wires. This whole section has to be gone through. So yeah, you did not want to plug this in not knowing what's going on. So just a warning, now over here it looks pretty clean. 
somebody has attached a coax cable and this cable is obviously hooked up to the Q multiplier. They've got this wad of tape that uh, keeps it from coming out the chassis. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, this is pretty typical of a radio that quote-unquote worked last time I plugged it in. So that's a little bit nasty. Uh, something uh, of a cataclysmic nature has taken place over here in the power supply section. So we're going to have to check that in the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of dust and dirt on this. Uh, these are uh, circuit cards uh, for tubes. They take quite a bit of abuse, of course. And uh, the bottom doesn't look too bad cosmetically, except around that transformer. There's obviously been some, some kind of problem there. But have got to figure out how to clean this top before we attempt any form of alignment or trying to power it on. We're in the very early stages of uh, preparation and repair. So I have now removed all the tubes from the beast. And we want to remove anything that might be damaged by water because I am going to put some water on this chassis to try to clean it up a little bit. Try to keep it to a minimum, but it does need uh, some cleaning. Uh, I've removed all the tubes and uh, I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, most of the tubes in the set are the original Matsushita tubes, you know, the originals that came with this set back in the 60s. Uh, there was one exception. There's an RCA 6GH8 that's been uh, a replacement tube. This uh, might be... Uh, so a little bit of preparation before I give this thing a bit of a bath. I put some uh, Kapton tape over the, uh, the IF transformers. And really, you should put uh, protection on anything that you don't want to get wet. Um, I'm just afraid if I had to dry out those transformers that, that it would uh, cause some trouble inside. Or if the water got in there, it would cause some corrosion where I can't get at it. So even though it looks like solid state, the HA700 is in fact a, uh, a tube type receiver. The only real solid state devices in it are some detector diodes and of course the power rectifiers. And we've seen that there's some goop that's come out of the transformer and it's pretty black down there in the power supply region. So it's probably a good bet that the main triple electrolytic capacitor that dates back to the 60s is probably part of the problem and I would not trust this capacitor. So the first thing we're going to have to do is order some capacitors to replace this. The ability to find a triple cap to go right in here exists. Um, you'll probably pay a premium for a 34 millimeter diameter type capacitor to go in here but uh, some tube type uh, guitar amplifiers and uh, and other types of uh, receivers and amplifiers of that era require replacements and you'll pay a premium upwards of uh, 30 to 40 dollars for a triple cap to replace this. Instead I'm going to use um, some ordinary uh, radial lead electrolytics and we'll find a way to mount those safely in the radio. I'll probably buy the, uh, the most inexpensive type and that is usually the 100 microfarad, 450 volt capacitors. So it has a higher voltage rating than this capacitor has, which is good. And uh, instead of doing a 100, 140 microfarad cap, I'll do a 100, 100, 100. More capacitance, more voltage. All of that is good because it just gives you more protection and more filtering. So we'll find a way to mount those three capacitors uh, safely in the radio. Also, the, uh, the diodes didn't look too healthy. First thing I'm going to do is uh, disconnect everything and see if the transformer itself works. So all of the capacitors in this receiver are, you know, on the order of 25, 35 years old. Especially the electrolytics, if this thing's been sitting in a garage, and it looks like it has been. They probably are pretty dried out. 
So just based on the fact that there's been smoke and grease and <laughs> residue in the power supply section, this triple cap, which is a dual 100 single 40, it's a triple cap, probably needs to be replaced. Also, look at some of the electrolytics, and just as a matter of course, you'll want to replace those electrolytics, those small ones. It's a very easy board to solder. It's single-sided. Just take those guys out and replace them. You can go up to uh, double the value without much happening. They're that tolerant. And uh, just make sure the voltage is higher than what's on the rating for the caps. You'll be okay. Now the, uh, the paper caps, like this 005, you can probably keep those. But if you want to change those out, put some of those yellow Mylar caps in. Uh, you know, the plastic film or metal film is fine. The resistors, you should check each one to see what value they've increased to. Generally, they will increase in value. And if they've gone up significantly, you can replace some of those as well. So after some basic cleanup, the dial string and the pulleys look quite good. They're nice and tight. Everything seems fine on those. There's no need to restring either the band spread or the main tuning dial strings. I would just uh, make sure everything's lubricated, each one of those little pulleys. Don't get any grease on the spindles. And uh, you can also see that the knobs are going to need a soak. So removal of the knobs is next. Get those all cleaned up before putting them back in the chassis. You can't really clean the front chassis and wax it properly with those knobs on anyway. So the next thing we're going to do is remove the knobs. So we made some progress. We got the top of the receiver cleaned off. We got our replacement parts on order, and we're going to be uh, working on this receiver and uh, applying power and trying to bring it back to life in the next video.